Banking on the banks to help him out, the Chancellor announces measures to help with mortgages. After yesterday's big interest hike, he called them into number 11 to come up with a plan to support those who are struggling. The biggest thing we can do for those families is be totally resolved and unflinching in our determination to remove high inflation from our economy. But this is no formal agreement, which Labour says it should be, and it's not the only political pressure mounting fast on Rishi Sunak's government. What do we want? Pay, pay. When do we want it? Now! Junior doctors to hold longest single strike in NHS history, a five-day walkout in July and just before three by-elections. Also on News at 10 tonight. The man who shot dead Sergeant Matt Brandner after smuggling a gun into custody found guilty of murder. The Titan sub-disaster, Canada launches an investigation and... So Our Foo Fighters were smuggled into Glastonbury and the crowd went wild. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. Two major issues are tonight crystallising some of the growing difficulties facing Rishi Sunak. The NHS and the economy were prominent in his famous five priorities back at the start of the year. Six months on, they're both beset by problems. The NHS in England once again faces disruption next month when junior doctors walk out for an unprecedented five days. More on that in a moment. But today, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt was forced to step in to soothe fears of rising mortgage repayments. After meeting the major banks and lenders, he agreed a series of measures to try to protect mortgage holders from soaring interest rates aimed at combating stubbornly high inflation. Measures which did not, however, impress the government's critics. A group of top bankers, among them the boss of Lloyds, summoned to a meeting with Jeremy Hunt. What did you say to the Chancellor? Good working level discussion. A good discussion, he said. Others described it as productive, with pledges of help for those facing spiralling payments. So what's actually been agreed? In future, borrowers will be able to extend their mortgage term, but within six months, revert to their original deal without a penalty. There'll be a minimum 12 months before any home is repossessed, and if you talk to a bank about financial difficulties, there'll be no impact on your credit score. But what about tax relief or other direct government help? The Chancellor's ruled that out. The biggest thing we can do for those families is be totally resolved and unflinching in our determination to remove high inflation from our economy. That is the Prime Minister and my number one priority because we know that is the best thing we can do to give people security, to put money back into people's pockets and to get the economy growing. The idea that homeowners should get a tax break has been mooted by some Tory backbenchers. Most economists disagree, as does this former Treasury advisor. But he also believes what's been announced today is essentially fine-tuning. Banks are already obligated by the FCA to show forbearance to lenders, whether that is you know, offering to extend the terms of loans or switch, switch to an interest-only mortgage. So that system is in place today. I think what the Chancellor announced probably today is sort of bells and whistles that sit on top of that, but it's not a fundamental reform. Charlotte Town and her partner already have a 33-year mortgage. Extending it is not an option, and she's fearful of the cliff edge they'll soon face. Our mortgage payments at the moment are 1650 um, and based on the rates out at the moment, our mortgage repayments would go up by at least £1,000 a month. So it's quite a substantial increase with the risk of it going up further between now and when our, when our rates are due to expire. The Labour leader visiting an airbase in Oxfordshire said a voluntary agreement wasn't enough. Making it mandatory, making it the lender's duty to do this, is, I think, an essential part of this. And I think the government's sort of saying, well, we hope for the best. We hope that some mortgage lenders do the right thing. That's not strong enough in a situation like this. 
but the Chancellor believes after today the vulnerable will be better protected. Libby Vina, News at 10, Westminster. Well, the five days of strikes called by junior doctors in England in their dispute over pay fall in the middle of next month. According to the BMA, they formed the longest single walkout by doctors in NHS history. Downing Street said the strike puts at risk both patient safety and the government's efforts to cut waiting lists. They walked out in March, then April and June. But now, junior doctors are planning the longest strike in NHS history. Five days in July that is likely to silence operating theatres like this one. Closed down in a previous strike as each one disrupts procedures and appointments for tens of thousands of patients. They say it's about pay, but also the pressure of staff shortages. It's demoralising. We come home in despair many days, and that's not a condition that we should be working in. It's not a condition that doctors or patients are thriving in. Over the last 10 days of junior doctor strikes, there have been a total of 476,120 hospital appointments cancelled. The average cancellations per strike day was almost 48,000. This compares to an average of just under 15,000 cancellations per day of nursing strikes. It's terrible news for NHS trusts, with some spending £2 million preparing for the last three-day strike. How bad is this? This is bad. I think we all felt our, our hearts sink when we saw the, the duration and scale of this. And this can't continue at a time when the NHS needs and wants to drive down the time that patients are waiting. He suggested mediators be brought in to break the impasse between the health secretary and doctors. Steve Barclay has offered a 5% pay rise. They want 35% to make up for real terms pay cuts. Sources on both sides suggest little hope of a quick resolution. All of this could turn into a nightmare for Rishi Sunak. Cutting NHS waiting lists is one of his five key pledges. But this strike finishes just two days before his party faces three critical by-elections. So who do voters blame? Both of them may be at fault. In North West London there were mixed no, views, no. but agreement that there needs to be a solution because these strikes will be quite painful. I think they should have enough money to pay the doctors. They do deserve to get on this strike. I mean, they, they're not really getting paid. The government said it was disappointed about the action in a month that will see strikes from teachers and railway workers too, and maybe senior doctors. But they'll be relieved about one thing, a nurse's ballot is expected to fall just short of the threshold needed for them to walk out too. Anushka Rastana, News at 10. Well, the timing of the latest round of strikes is pretty awkward for the government with those key by-elections looming. The British Medical Association says the junior doctors' walkout will start at 7am on Thursday the 13th of July and end at 7am on Tuesday the 18th. Later that week, there's also fresh action affecting 14 train operators on the 20th, 22nd and the 29th of July. All this at a time when the Conservatives will be vying to protect three seats in those by-elections including, of course, the one vacated by Boris Johnson. And Libby's with me here to talk through this, this sort of pile of problems mounting now for the government. And some of these sort of a rod for the Prime Minister's own back created by himself six months ago with these pledges. Yes, five pledges. And it does look tonight as though... There is a serious doubt as to whether he's going to be able to meet two of them at least. Uh, one of them halving inflation, the other being getting hospital waiting lists down. Now, inflation remains stubbornly high. And although the Bank of England raised its interest rate yesterday to try and deal with it, uh, the Prime Minister also effectively admitted that he thought that was the only lever to try and control inflation, and it was out of his control. A very difficult thing for a Prime Minister to concede. Um, when it comes to the NHS, we've just heard as to how disruptive these doctor strikes have been for the NHS. Um, five more days of strike action planned, and I think for people on hospital waiting lists, a very worrying prospect, and the opposition parties will rightly be able to claim that waiting lists are going to get longer, not shorter, as a result of this. Now, at the start of this week, um, we saw that uh, Boris Johnson could only muster seven votes in that crucial debate 
on the Privileges Committee report into his conduct. You think that would, uh, in a sense, be a cause for celebration in number 10, and uh, they were very much saying they did want to move on now. But the question is, move on to what? More economic pain for homeowners, more worry for people on hospital waiting lists. It's hardly the fresh start that Rishi Sunak would have wanted. Indeed, a long week indeed, Libby. Thank you very much indeed for that. Now, it was the circumstances of custody Sergeant Matt Ratner's violent death that sent shockwaves through Britain's police community. Louis de Zoyza was today convicted of his murder. Despite having been searched, he managed to smuggle a gun into a police station before using it to shoot Sergeant Ratner at point-blank range. The jury rejected de Zoyza's plea that he had suffered an autistic meltdown. The reason is there's a lot of burglaries in this area, OK? Yeah. It's half one in the morning. I don't know who you are. You've probably got a totally legitimate excuse, all right? This is Louis de Zoyza being stopped and searched by a police patrol in South London in the early hours of September the 25th, 2020. Police body cam recordings show him looking nervous as he confesses to being in possession of cannabis. But when he's searched, they find a bag containing homemade bullets. Yeah, canisters. Oh, oh. And right, at the moment, right. I'm placing you under arrest okay. for sorry. possession of what I believe to be bullets. Metropolitan Police Sergeant Matt Ratner was the officer in charge of the custody suite in Croydon that evening. He was just months from retirement after 30 years of service in the job he loved. I'm Matt Ratner, head coach. The 54-year-old was also a dedicated rugby coach, spending his spare time bringing on players at East Grinstead. My name's Matt, I'm the custody officer, right? I'm in charge. But in the holding cell that night, as de Zoysa, still handcuffed, was being searched again, he somehow managed to pull out an antique revolver he'd concealed, firing it four times. <laughs> The first two shots hit Sergeant Ratner, the third hit the wall as he struggled with the officers who'd arrested him, and the fourth hit de Zoysa in the neck, causing him brain damage. I think the bravery of those two officers at that point in time uh, is something that none of us can ever quite put ourselves in that position. Um, I know, having spoken to them, the thoughts about the consequences of they not having found the firearm on the street itself but going back to search de Zoysia again at the police station is something which I'm sure will never leave them. The jury at Northampton Crown Court unanimously found de Zoysia guilty of the murder of Sergeant Ratner, dismissing the defence's claim that the 25-year-old had suffered an autistic meltdown. Outside the court, Matt's partner Sue called this a day of justice. Whilst the court case has concluded, the constant feeling of grief and loss continues. My love for Matt, my gentle giant, will never end. He will never be forgotten. The IOPC, the police watchdog, has recommended the widespread use of search wands. And since Matt Ratner's death, the Met has issued 4,000 handheld metal detectors to frontline officers, vehicles and in custody suites, as well as installing its first airline-style scanner in a custody suite in South London. Changes that it's hoped will prevent an attack like the one that killed Sergeant Ratner, an officer who dedicated his life to protecting others. Martha Fairley, News at 10. The alleged leader of a people smuggling gang today pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of 39 men, women and children found dead in a lorry trailer in Essex. Marius Drogici appeared at the Old Bailey after being arrested in Romania last year. The victims, who were all Vietnamese nationals, paid up to £13,000 to be shipped to Britain, hidden inside a container in 2019. They were found suffocated to death. Russia's war against Ukraine took an extraordinary twist tonight when the head of the notorious Wagner group of mercenaries apparently threatened to turn against Moscow. In an explosive series of messages, Yevgeny Prigozhin seemed to accuse Russia of killing scores of his fighters in a rocket attack. He then appeared to declare war on Russia's military leadership, saying, we need to end this mess. 
The Kremlin condemned the messages as provocation. Well, Emma is in Dnipro in eastern Ukraine. Uh, Emma, this all seems pretty extraordinary. How seriously is this all being taken? Well, it is extraordinary, but there has been an awful lot of uh, infighting between the Wagner Group and the Russian military and the Russian leadership, actually, over the last few months. I think it's too early to say just how significant it is, but it is clearly being taken incredibly seriously in Moscow. They have put the intelligence services on high alert. We know that there are roadblocks in different parts of the country and that they are assessing exactly what the situation is. The issue with this is that, you know, he, the leader of the Wagner Group, has called for not an armed uprising, but a march for justice. And it's very, very vague what that means. And that is why the Russian authorities are so concerned about this, why they're acting as they are. But the whole situation with this war with Russia and Ukraine has been couched in propaganda, in innuendo in speculation for so long that it is too early, too difficult and really impossible for anybody to say with any level of absolute authority what is going on. There's no doubt that something significant is going on. This is an important moment and I know from speaking to sources in foreign governments that tonight they are watching it very carefully but it would be too soon to say that this is a particularly significant moment in this war and indeed in Vladimir Putin's reign. Emma, thank you very much. Canada announced tonight it is launching an investigation into the loss of the Titan sub in which five people, including three Britons, died as they attempted to explore the wreck of the Titanic. Evidence now suggests their submersible suffered a catastrophic implosion as it was descending on Sunday. More tributes were also paid today to those who lost their lives. As investigations into the Titan's catastrophic implosion begin, the failure to address safety warnings is a growing area of concern. Experts had raised their fears over its design and the lack of regulation. But the company behind it, OceanGate, insisted it was safe. Titanic film director James Cameron says concerns were ignored. I think we're also seeing a parallel here with unheeded warnings about a sub that was not certified where the, the entire deep submergence community actually, or not the entire community, but a large number of them got together to write a letter to OceanGate, the company, and say, we believe that this could lead to catastrophe. Tributes were paid today to the victims. OceanGate founder Stockton Rush has been described as the last of the great American dreamers. British businessman Hamish Harding has been called a passionate explorer who lived for his family, business and the next adventure. Veteran explorer Paul-Henri Nagiolet has been called talented, iconic and legendary, the greatest deep diver the world has known, according to his peers. While the family of father and son, Shazada and Sulman Dalwood, have said that family values are their guiding beacon and that Shazada strived to emulate and teach those values to his children. Paul-Henri Nagiolet's stepson says he wasn't worried, given the diver's experience. When he told me he was going back out for this expedition, uh, when I saw him in May, um, I really honestly didn't think twice about it. Um, it's one of those things where he's been down there so much. He's been uh, on so many different you know, deep dives that I just, you know, I didn't bat an eye. As efforts to find answers begin, the victims' families are left with only memories. And Neil joins us now. So, Neil, tell us more about the investigation by the Canadian authorities announced tonight. Well, firstly, Julie, there is actually a new mission underway down at the wreck site to that debris field that was discovered yesterday using these remotely operated vehicles to try and gather more evidence uh, from the Titan submersible. Canada's Transportation Safety Board, as you say, has announced a new inquiry uh, tonight into all of this. A team is heading as we speak en route here to St John's. Of course, uh, the vessel's uh, support ship, the Polar Prince, is a Canadian flagged ship. Uh, it left port here, of course, last Friday with the Titan on board. 
There are reports tonight that the US National Transportation Safety Board has been asked to assist the Coast Guards there with the inquiry that is underway. One of the areas of focus here will be the carbon fibre hull of the Titan submersible and the titanium parts of that vessel. How did they interact? Was it structurally sound? There are so many questions here that are building up, but there is a real desire here tonight to provide answers and fast. OK, thank you very much indeed, Neil. A lot has changed since Britain voted to leave the EU exactly seven years ago today. One of the differences is that all seasonal agricultural workers arriving from abroad now need six-month visas. But with the summer fruit picking season currently getting into full swing, there are calls tonight to offer them better incentives. Workers say they're often treated poorly and find it hard even to cover their travel and living costs. An industry that is, for most of us, hidden from view. The UK's fruit and vegetable picking business employs tens of thousands of low-paid workers, almost all of whom come from overseas. An army of hard-working migrants in hot, humid conditions, and with a visa scheme that only allows for six months' work, many of them may struggle to pay off the debts they may have incurred just to get here. The UK's biggest uh, non -profit. The House of Lords are investigating the sector. They've been hearing damning evidence from workers who've been on the front line. We weren't viewed, um, from my experience, as um, humans. We were more chattel. In the mornings, even when we met uh, to start the day, you were called by numbers, um, which for me is. It's not how you treat people who you employ. Employers aren't happy either with a seasonal visa scheme that fails to give them what they need. The positive is that we are 100% reliant on a visa scheme for our seasonal workers for force. Without that visa scheme, the UK berry industry would collapse and disappear. Um, the negatives are that it's clunky. We'd like people to be able to stay for nine months, building up experience, but also earning more money, which is great for the workers. And we'd like them to only have to leave the country for three months so they can come back early for next season. Data shows that the source of migrant workers coming to the UK for seasonal work has shifted dramatically in recent years. In 2019, more than 90% of seasonal worker visas were issued to those coming from Ukraine. This was down to just 23% last year, with a much greater reliance of workers from countries outside Europe, like Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. For some, the potential for exploitation of workers in the UK is similar to the migrants who built World Cup football stadiums in Qatar. What we see is a real uh, similarity in terms of the ways that workers are exploited. So an example of that would be the charging of illegal recruitment fees in source countries. These are often secured against workers' homes and possessions. In Devon, one farmer hopes the industry will change. On this organic farm, only a handful of workers are employed under the seasonal visa scheme. With workers here sharing in the business, the jobs are more attractive to locals. I think we need to see a progressive, iterative change away from this, you know, very large scale vegetable production um, with some questionable um, employment practices, you know, fields full of caravans, sometimes companies employing hundreds and hundreds of people uh, where, you know, there won't be a word of English spoken in the field. You know, I feel I feel a little bit ashamed, actually, to be a part of an industry where that is a, a, the norm. The government say the welfare of visa holders is of paramount importance and they're clamping down on poor working conditions and exploitation. For many, improving the lot of migrant workers ought to be like picking low-hanging fruit. But with politics and immigration also in play, it's likely to be easier said than done. Rupert Evelyn, News at 10. The visit to the USA by India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi this week had all the pomp and ceremony you'd expect from a major state visit. Both he and President Biden are facing elections next year. But for Mr Biden, it was also an opportunity to draw an important ally away from the diplomatic overtures of Russia and China. The US-India relationship is seen by this White House as one of the most significant in the world. And the president is seeking to show there can be an axis of democracies in the face of rising autocracy. A toast to our partnership, to our people, to the possibilities that lie ahead, to two great friends, two great nations, and two great powers. Cheers.
Nations. This is only the third state visit of this administration, and President Biden used it to position India as a power that can compete with and help contain a rising China. And it is in America's DNA, and I believe in India's DNA, uh, that uh, the whole world, uh, the whole world has a stake in our success, both of us, in maintaining our democracies, makes us appealing partners, and enables us to uh, expand democratic institutions across around the world. Outside the White House, there was a small protest. And certainly there is concern in the West that Narendra Modi's India is embracing Hindu nationalism and failing to protect the rights of India's Muslim minority. In Congress, that was largely overlooked, with China the far greater concern. And Modi played to that sentiment to rapturous applause. Together, we shall demonstrate that democracies matter and democracies deliver. God bless America, Jahin, long live India US friendship. Thank you. America is simultaneously trying to manage a fraught relationship with China, with the US Secretary of State meeting with President Xi this week. For Washington, the policy towards Beijing is to keep lines of communications open while urging allies in the Indo-Pacific to combat China's military buildup. Even while questions about Modi's commitment to democracy remain, America's more immediate ambition is to boost India as a diplomatic power, hoping to slow China's growing dominance across Asia. Robert Moore, News at 10, Washington. England's cricketers fought back well on day two of the women's Ashes test at Trent Bridge against Australia, of course. They're going to come back for two. It's a brilliant hundred, a brilliant Ashes hundred. After Australia had posted a big first innings total of 473, England needed to get off to a good start. And thanks to Tammy Beaumont making an unbeaten debut Ashes century, they've done just that. England closed the day on a healthy 218 for two with three days' play remaining. And finally, there was a major surprise at Glastonbury tonight, an unscheduled set by the American group Foo Fighters, making their first appearance at the festival for six years. And if that stole the thunder a bit from the night's headline act, the Arctic Monkeys, well, the delighted crowd didn't seem to mind too much. The Foo Fighters are no strangers to a big crowd. Dropping by this year's Glastonbury for a surprise performance and paying tribute to late drummer Taylor Hawkins. I'd like to dedicate this song to Mr. Taylor Hawkins. Sing it for tea. They've been to Worthy Farm before, but not all industry icons have. At 76, music legend Sir Elton John doesn't have many first times anymore. This Sunday, he makes his Glasto debut as he bids farewell to touring in the UK. Though he's not the only newbie. Rick Astley's here for the first time too, and after major singing success in the late 80s, he's planning on lighting up the stage once again. Obviously, we've got headline acts, we've got the pyramid stage, we've got all that going on. But I think people drift into a tent or they walk into a, you know, an area where there's a stage and think, is this for me? Oh, it is now. I think it's going to be interesting tomorrow because obviously I'm on really early, I'm on at 12 o'clock. That audience hasn't come to see me necessarily, maybe one or two of them have, who knows, but they've come to the festival and they want to get in that spot. So my job is to entertain them for 45 minutes and that's what I'm going to do whilst enjoying myself. There's no way I'm walking off that stage not feeling that my band and myself and the crew have had a good time. So because we may never get to do it again, or I may never get to do it again, so I want to enjoy it, you know? You were here for me. Did I just not do it for you superficially? Cause you were here for me. At just 23, Maisie Peters also inducted herself into the Glastonbury Club. Because of scheduling issues, this year's headliners are all men. Maisie was one of only a few women who will play the pyramid stage. I take that, I'm very honoured, and I was very honoured to be asked. I really hope that next year and the years to come, there'll be more women on that stage, as there should, there's so many that should be. 
The tent's pegged, the stage is filled, for three days of music that'll be heard far and wide. Rishi Davda, News at 10 at Glastonbury Festival. What a weekend ahead. That is it for tonight from all the team here. Good night. Have a great one.